Thank you, Dr. Abashi. Uh, how do you do this? Um, thank you for giving me the pleasure and privilege to uh, present this data. Uh, as a clinician, I would like to present a case first. I'll have to go through this pretty quickly. I hope I'm not talking as fast as the delivery man for the old Federal, Ex Federal Express commercial, but we only have 20 minutes. So in November of four, a 19-year-old white female developed a severe respiratory infection and while living in a college dormitory in, in um, Wisconsin, the whole dorm got sick, basically. The symptoms improved after about a month, even after Zithromax three treatment. About four or five months later, this is often seen in these patients, she then had an insidious occurrence, a right lower quadrant pain, low-grade fever, nice sweats, and fatigue. Bad enough, she could not even concentrate. She actually had to quit college. Two months later, under the HMO uh, uh, plan that she eventually saw a gastroenterologist, a CT scan of the abdomen showed a circumferential thickening of the terminal ileum, and a colonoscopy done at that time showed nodular lesions in the terminal ileum. A biopsy showed lymphoid hyperplasia. This is the pyrus patches, but no evidence of granuloma suggests of Crohn's disease. A week post-biopsy, she was hospitalized with severe weakness and fatigue, fever to 102, nice sweats, debilitating myalgia, vomiting, diarrhea, and marked leukopenia. Absolute neutral, neutral field count was only 350. But bone marrow biopsy showed normal cellular elements, but we detected enterovirus RNA in the bone marrow. This is the appearance of the terminal ileum. You see all these nodular swelling, a little bit with the subcutaneous hemorrhage, and you see all these little nodules. These are swelling of the pyrus patches. We detected enterovirus RNA in the biopsy specimen. And later on, uh, Mike Bowler at the Department of Microbiology at Torrance Memorial Hospital used the real-time PCR and used the armor RNA standard provided by estrogen. And we detected actually 100,000 copies of enteroviral RNA in a 40 micron section of a two by three millimeter biopsy. So how much virus do you think she had in a terminal ileum and the rest of her body? This is the first time that we could show how powerful, how many viruses that could be there. Her, IG, the IgM and IG, IgG antibodies for adenovirus, CMV, were negative. We didn't do HHV6 antibody at that time, unfortunately, but later on her HHV6 IgG was found to be at low titer. EVV IgG was positive with a negative IgM. Coxsackie B1 through 6 and Echovirus 6, 7, 9, 11, 30 antibodies were negative. So this was one of the other enteroviruses. We gave her two doses of intravenous immunoglobulin, which basically caused a significant improvement of her symptoms and fevers. Leukopenia improved, and she was discharged after seven days. For the next four months, she had continual fatigue, myalgia, headache, function, the symptoms of functional dyspepsia, irritable bowel syndrome, but was able to maintain three to four hours per day for the next four months. Afterwards, she lapsed into a severe state of CFS with continued GI symptoms, anorexia, and mild weight loss. Because of persistent GI symptoms, uh, we convinced her to get a, get a, uh, get a uh, have an EGD with a stomach biopsy. And by doing an immunoproxy stain of the enteral biopsy, we can see fairly extensive staining. This, this showed up as brown spots. The blue is the background, which is normal. And by a higher magnification, we can see the protein is concentrated in parietal cells. So this is a case that we, well, I think we have fairly clear evidence that there was acute enterovirus infection. Even about six months later, that could have been a second infection. She had a very high levels of viruses in the terminal ileum. And a year and a half after the hospitalization, we were still able to find enterovirus RNA and protein in the stomach biopsy. I'd like to just review the past evidence for enterovirus persistence in CFS ME patients. Nairn basically did a lot of work on this and found PCR assay was a better test than neutralizing antibodies for differentiating the CFS patients from controls. Go, uh, also from Scotland, found enterovirus RNA sequence in a muscle biopsy specimen from 53% of the patients and 19% of the controls. They were criticized for using normal controls. So they were told to maybe you should use some patient with neuromuscular diseases such, such as muscular uh, dystrophy, et cetera. A subsequent studies actually showed that there were no difference between the CFS patient muscle biopsy and the patients with mus uh, other muscular neuromuscular diseases. 
Yousef reported CVV RNA persistence in muscle fibers in 6 out of 13, or 46%, adult patients with dermatomyositis or polymyositis using in situ hybridization. Perhaps the biggest contribution of Dr. Yousef is the 5DA-1 monoclonal antibody. This is the one that is specific for an epitope in the BP1 region, and is broadly cross-reactive. This antibody I use in the immunoproxidase assay. Cunningham, as Dr. Chapman already mentioned, found that enteroviral RNA found in the muscle biopsy had a positive negative ratio of 1 to 1, rather than the 100 to 1 ratio found in usually the, the enterovirus cultures. So this, there's definitely a different ways of, uh, a way of replication in these muscle tissues. Then the same group, I'm sorry, this is the French group that actually Shea et al. basically found enterovirus RNA in the muscle biopsies of 20% of fibromyalgia patients as compared to zero other controls. And a few other studies show negative findings. This is a study I must mention. This was an unfortunate patient with chronic fatigue syndrome for five years, attempted suicide, and died of complications. The tissues were removed uh, pre-mortem and from various parts of the body, and RT-PCR was done compared to four control samples from patients with CVA and four, died of, four uh, psychiatric patients who died of suicide. As you can see here, there's definite amplification of this RNA in the lane label patient, and it's not seen in the one label as normal. Enterovirus RNA actually were found in muscles, heart, hypothalamus. These are key words, and brainstem. And the RNA sequence showed 83% homology to Coxsackie B3. Even though this is only one case, this tells you the virus can be there. Okay? Other people can criticize there's only one case. Well, if you can get any other case, let me know. Then this is a highly cited study. Okay? Detection of enterovirus specific RNA in serum, the relationship to chronic fatigue. This was done by Clemens, Naren, Galbraith, and published in Journal of Medical Virology in 1995. This was a blinded control study. CF, uh, CF patient fulfilled the Oxford criteria established in 1991. Then basically, serum and Buffy coats were, and also stool were taken from the patients and extracted. RT-PCR uh, were done with four primers. This is a very sensitive assay, according to the paper. And a 264 base pair band was generated by two rounds of PCR. These actually were confirmed by sequencing and published in another paper in 1997. Let me just draw your attention to the, 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 uh, the row that labels CF serum. They found enterovirus RNA in 41%. As compared to the orange row, the control serum is only 2%. This is a blind study. Then if you look at the Buffy code of the patient, a CFH patient was 27%. Remember this number because it's going to be very relevant. Eventually, the British um, met and uh, a report was generated. This report is entitled Report of the Joint Working Group of the Royal Colleges of Physicians, Psychiatrists, and General Practitioners, CFS. Dr. Stephen Strauss, a great herpes virologist, um, sadly said, has passed away over a year ago, uh, wrote an editorial commenting on uh, uh, this, this report. And it, let me just quote here. In Britain, the preeminence of a neuromuscular hypothesis of CFS sustained a preoc preoccupation with enteroviruses as ideologic factors for two decades. The weight of the evidence stands largely against this now. The report does note one blind study, the one I just showed you, in which EV sequence were detected more often in sera from patients than from healthy controls, still a waste repetition. Our own blind study using PCR found no EV RNA in the sera or other specimens from patients or controls. And the work was done by Hardy Robart, since, and this was unpublished. So the detail of how the blood was handled how sensitive the assays were never revealed. So, but this was sort of the turning point for this field because viruses weren't really, the finding on viruses were not replicated and thus led to a change in the paradigm. The reason I started working on this, in 1997, by serendipity, we found out the right way to test for antibodies in these patients. Uh, for enteroviruses. We can only test for six Coxsackie B and five of the 26 echoviruses. By serendipity, 
the blood was sent to the wrong laboratory and they did the right test. So now we know this is the most sensitive and most specific test. And also in 1997, my son came down with this illness. And as a dad, busy seeing patients, I didn't realize my son even had this illness for a whole year. And when I get his blood test results, then I realized two of the virus tests, Coxsackie V3 and Coxsackie V4, were way up here at 640. This is a reciprocal titers of the neutralizing antibody. It basically ranged from minus 5 or negative to 640. And we basically had to understand what's the significance of these titers. So what we did was we, we took the first 200 patients with CFS and also took 150 controls. These controls comprised of their spouses, their relatives, the friends that brought them in, and also patients who were seen in our clinic for very well-defined infections, not chronic fatigue syndrome, like endocarditis, osteomyelitis, etc. So the x-axis shows the titers for Coxsackie B1 through 5. We, we didn't see any Coxsackie B6, so it was very rare. And then Echovirus 6, 7, 9, 11, 30. You can see in the whites, these were the control titers. And the means are way down here. And you see the black ones are way up here. So the difference is black and white. So basically, we had a baseline to compare with. So what we did was any significant titer is defined as two, greater than 2 times the mean plus 2 standard deviations. So half of these patients actually had elevated titers against these 11 enteroviruses. So from this point on, we went on to study. Because we know by this time, elevated serum neutralizing antibodies is not going to convince anybody in this world. So we basically went on to try to replicate the studies of the British investigators. Initially, the studies were done at UCLA uh, Harbor General with Dr. Joe and Dr. Liebling, and this was a pilot study. It was blinded. We only had six negative controls. I was one of them, and all six were negative. And then we, what we basically did was that we took the peripheral blood mononuclear cells from these patients. The blood were drawn in uh, uh, ACDA, uh, acid citrate, dextrose, A tube, capped at four, 4 degrees for 18 hours. Then the, this was just logistic. We couldn't give it to them until the next morning. The RNA was extracted. Then uh, RT-PCR was performed with four primers. The nest, uh, this is a nest of PCR. It's a very, very sensitive test. And this could detect down to about one copy of the virus you know, from, a, uh, from a culture. So this will generate a 295 base pair, which is this one right here. This is a very finicky assay because sometimes just by changing the primary concentration just by a little bit or putting a little bit less or more RNA, we basically have no amplification. It's a very difficult test to do. So maybe this is why the literatures are, are conflicting. So we found that 6 out of 20 patients with high titers of antibodies against enteroviruses were positive in the peripheral blood mononuclear cells. And 10%, or only 2 out of 20, were positive in the serum. The next pilot study was done at specialty laboratory. We had 23 uh, chronic fatigue patients' blood sent to them. The blood, unfortunately, was not processed for 48 hours because some mix-up in communication. This assay uses Dr. Robart's two primer. Remember, this is the, the gentleman in Denver Children's Hospital that did the work with Dr. Steven Strauss, and use a one-step RT-PCR enzyme, and then agarose gel analysis. Well, lo and behold, 6 out of 22, or 27 percent of the patient, had detectable enterovirus RNA in the peripheral blood mononuclear cells. All six positive sequences were 97 to 99 percent homologous to Coxsackie B or echoviruses, but they are not identical. They eliminate the possibility of cDNA contamination. Only 4 out of 23, or 17%, had detectable enterovirus RNA in the plasma. Because this type of gel-based analysis is very slow, we could not really possibly screen a large amount of patients. So we actually, by, by luck, found a kit made by Chemicon. And actually, this is the, the method patented by Dr. Robart. This is actually what we call a RT-PCR EIA. So this employs biotinylated primers, and using a probe on the bo coated on the uh, bottom of the well and uh, for hybridization, then we develop uh, the, the positive reaction into a color. As you can see here on the right lower end, this is a native control. It shows no color. This is basically 1,000 copies of an RNA standard. This is 100. This is a 10. Okay, so this is a fairly sensitive assay. 
This is actually one of the one of the the, the wells, one of the um, plays that we ran the patient samples. So a number of the patients were positive. The only difference between this assay and Dr. Robar's assay is that Chemicom actually added one more primer. This is a semi-nested semi PCR. This is a much more sensitive test compared to Dr. Robar's test. And the Kaijin one-step RT-PCR enzyme we employ for which this assay was optimized for. So this work took probably four or five years. And on weekends, my son and I basically did all this. And uh, this uh, initially, 50 out of 131, or 38 percent, of the most symptomatic CFS patients tested positive twice or more versus only two out of 52 controls, 4% of the controls were positive. This was statistically significant. Then we went on to take multiple samples. Actually, we took more than 2,500 blood samples from more than 510 patients. 179 out of 510 patients, or 35%, had repeatedly positive enterovirus RNA, at least twice, okay? Of the first 100 patients we analyzed, the people that have multiple positive RNA samples Actually, the, for the bedridden patients, 70% of them were positive, and the patients who have a little bit a better higher energy level, somewhere around four to five, only 12% of them were positive. And it's important to note that this assay sensitivity was about 80 to 800 copies of RNA per ml of blood. Any time that we had more than the sensitivity less than 8,000 copies, we don't have any positive samples. So it's very, very clear that the RNA even present is at very low level, just like Nora said. On the right-hand corner, if you look at this table, what this tried to show you is that this is the first 20 patients, okay? And when we did serial blood samples, either three months, six months, and up to 24 months, you can see some positive, some negative. It's very rare to see a positive a patient with positive sample every single time. This is not like HIV, hepatitis B, or hepatitis C. Those patients are constantly positive with irene. The next thing that we were concerned about is how the blood was handled. So we tried to use um, uh, PEX gene tubes, which had you know the, the, the mechanism of RNA pres preservation. So we compared the PEX gene tube with ACDA tubes. But this, I actually have to process within four, le less than four hours. Between the patient, I have to actually go to the lab and centrifuge the tubes and take the buffy coat out and put it into the lysis buffer. But 17 out of 62 of the packaging tubes were positive, 27%. 27%. And the ACDA tubes, 15 out of 62, or 25%, were positive. They're actually comparable. But if we wait a long time, then this, the percent of this will drop. This actually, the numbers are a little bit lower because at this time we said, why don't we use the high, only the highest positive as a positive, okay? So the optical density had to be greater than 3.0 as a positive test. So then we went on to, to had 226 patients draw with a PAX gene tube. 65 out of 226, so 29% of this was positive. A number of the random samples were confirmed to be enterovirus. Next, it comes the stomach biopsies. Because the patient had persistent complaints, 60 to 90 percent of them, so we basically looked at the, uh, the, the stomach biopsies. A number of the patients actually have very limited inflammation in the stomach. Some has very diffuse inflammation. What we used was the immunoproxy staining for the VP1 protein of enterovirus, which is cross-reactive among most of the enteroviruses. Here is the staining for, this is a two-plus staining here. This is the, the, the staining of the same tissue with CNV, which you don't see any staining. This is a one plus staining, which you see much less. This is a higher magnification that shows the brown spots. I will skip this one, because the time limit. This is a patient who had an acute gastrointestinal infection, and the time of the hospitalization was biopsy that showed these brown spots suggest an enterovirus infection. And four years later, after developing chronic fatigue syndrome, we still saw the same. So the summary of this, let me just go to the very bottom. Um, to date, 263 patients, uh, out of 263 patient samples, 217 were positive, 82%. 11 out of 56 controls were positive. If we use a two-plus staining as a definitive positive test, then 57% uh, then of the patient samples were positive, only 5% of the controls were positive. That gave us a specificity of 95%. 
This is important to cover. I'm sorry I may take a little more time, but I, I think I need to go over this very carefully. Basically, with the first, first 13 samples, we have, they've been sick anywhere from four years to 20 years. And the protein staining is listed here. The RNA later, this is the viral RNA extraction of the tissues we listed here. Then we basically culture these tissues. When we cultured in normal cells and waited four weeks, there was absolutely no growth. But with prime, well, the cell cultures, then we treated with 5-IDU and dexamethasone. It, the virus grew in four weeks, much more in six weeks. When we pass this culture into the other, another infected cultures, uninfected cultures, the virus came up again. These have been sequenced, confirmed, and also a separate samples were sent to Dr. St Stephen Tracy's lab, and these confirms the RNA here, which were equivalent to the viral cultures. Subsequent cell culture experiments show a non, also show non-cellopathic viruses were growing in actinomycin D-treated virus 76 cells. Several of the previous positive stomach lysates were repeatedly positive. The 151 base pair cDNA products were sequenced and confirmed to be enteroviruses, but we were unable to sequence the rest of the gene and we could not keep the virus in culture. I'm not gonna go over this in detail, we'll just go over this case. This is a, yeah. This is a patient we treat actually with viral RNA found in the blood in two different laboratories sequenced. Was treated with alpha and gamma interferon, Pegasus and Actimmune. Her en energy level was very low, was about 30 out of possible 140 for two weeks. When we treated the patient here, the energy level obviously dropped because of the side effects of interferon. This asterisk denotes that there were improvement of her ejection fraction from 40 to 65 percent at the end of the one month treatment. A month later, she, her energy level went up. She actually went back to full-time work and was, con was staying out from 7 to 11. After physical exertion about five, six months later, her viral RNA test became po positive when she relapsed. After she rested about a month and a half, her energy level shot up, went back to full-time work, and picked up 20 more hours of work. And this, this remission lasted about 15 months. And it's interesting that when I took her off her Valtrex, for herpes infection, to within two weeks, she relapsed. And I had to retreat her by adding back the Valtrex did not help. So basically, conclusion. EVRNA has been found in the blood of American patients with MECFS, which replicated the British finding. We, exam we extended the observation by finding viral protein, EVRNA, and growth of non-cytopathic viruses in the stomach tissues. Aside of the initial replication and persistent symptoms of MECFS patients, Treatment data demonstrated the importance of our RNA in MECFS patients. I think it's time to develop better antiviral therapy for enteroviruses, which are significant causes of MECFS. Thank you.